Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. My name is Alexis Fishman. I'm a board member of 3GNY and the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. And we are so excited to present this special online event from oral history to written story, 3G authors discuss writing and publishing their family stories. For those of you who may be with us for the first time, 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and supporters. As a living link, we aim to preserve the legacies and lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. 3GNY's flagship initiative and what we're most proud of is our We Do program, short for We Educate. We Do trains grandchildren of survivors to learn and share their grandparents' stories with school students and community groups. To date, our speakers have spoken in more than 800 classrooms, impacting over 40,000 students and community members. We are largely a volunteer-run organisation and are funded by the generosity of our community, so we thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, our program this evening features three amazing women, all three Gs, two of whom are graduates of the WeDo program, but tonight we are not talking about spoken testimony, but rather written testimony. And I am so excited to introduce you to these exceptionally talented writers and members of our community. Michelle Weinfeld graduated from the University of Maryland with a master's in finance and has gone on to work as a CPA. Passionate about Jewish learning, Michelle's love of history and storytelling drove her to write her debut intergenerational memoir, From Generation to Generation which interweaves her experiences with anti-Semitism uh, with the story of her grandfather. Brooke Randall is a writer and associate creative director in Chicago. Her writing has been published in Hippocampus, Hypertext Magazine, Jewish Fiction and elsewhere. She is a prose editor for Chestnut Review and writes on issues of memory, trauma, family and history. She is currently working on a memoir about her grandma, literacy and the legacy of the Holocaust. Rachel Zolotov's writing journey began after a conversation with her mother about her family history. It didn't take long for her to realize that she had a story that was worth sharing. And after years of research and writing, the girl with the silver star was born. Rachel has a background in jewelry and user experience design and enjoys being creative. She lives in St. Louis, Missouri with her husband and two daughters. So welcome to our three wonderful panelists. Um, and again, thank you all so much for being here with us. Uh, so first, we're going to hear um, short excerpts from each of their works. Oh, and I'll also just mention um, that we do have the chat uh, open and the Q&A open. So if you've got comments or questions at any point during the night, please throw them in the chat and we will um, have a chance to answer those a little bit later on. Um, so Michelle, why don't you start us off? Uh, and I'll also just ask um, for each of you to perhaps share a little bit um, of your family history too, or anything else that you'd like to uh, tell us that helps, you know, helps us understand these readings. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start by just thanking everyone for coming. Thank you 3GNY for uh, organizing this incredible program. And it's really nice that it's three women on this panel during International Women's Month, which is uh, really awesome too. So my family history is um, my grandfather grew up in Munkach. You can call it Hungary, you can call it Czechoslovakia, you can call it Austria, wherever, uh, depending on where the borders are at any given time. But we generally identify as Hungarian. And the large majority of that is due to the fact that my grandfather's father was actually a well-renowned war hero in um, World War I. So in when they were living in Hungary, as you know, the Nazis were rising to power and as anti-Semitism was on the rise, they had a little bit of a unique experience where they were not subject to all the same rules and regulations as other Jews. And because of this privileged status, they ultimately didn't leave because they thought that the country and the government would protect them. And Ultimately, um, that wasn't the case. And my grandfather's family was put into a ghetto. His brother was sent away to forced labor slightly prior to that. And ultimately his family was sent to Auschwitz where both of his parents ended up being killed. His mother instantly that first day, she was holding her nephew and her, um, my grandfather's father only a month before liberation. Um, 
My grandfather was then sent after a few days in Auschwitz to Fufenteifen, which is a subcamp of Gross Rosen. And he stayed throughout the entire time with two of his first cousins, um, one of whom survived the war with him. And then a lot of my story actually, while the Holocaust is definitely a big component, I felt that it was really important to stay true to the way that my grandfather lived his life and not make the book solely about this one horrible experience that he really tried not to allow to define the rest of the way he lived. Um, so with that, I realized that my own experiences with anti-Semitism and understanding the generational trauma associated with that was really what led me to write my book and kind of incorporate themes from both of our lives and how we're connected that way. And one of the major themes and ways that I believe my grandfather and I were connected was through food. And that was really how our history was shared. Um, and the, expert, the excerpt that I'm gonna be sharing from my book is about when my grandfather and his cousin arrived in Poland after being liberated and they went to a Polish church for food and ultimately papers to help them get back home. As they arrived in Poland, they knew papers were necessary to continue on to the river, to continue their voyage. They saw a church in the center of town and decided that that would be the best place to start. The priest was kind and welcoming, allowing them to stop and relax for a while. In this time, he was able to acquire papers for them from the local police. The Polish were very religious people, you see. So that's how we chose to go to the church. You know, this guy was the Pope, Poppy noted before continuing his story. Um, side note on that, we've done some research and it is actually possible that that was the Pope. Um, so pretty interesting. Upon their arrival at the church, the priest asked if they'd eaten breakfast and they replied they had not. As they were welcomed into the church, they were greeted by the aromatic saltiness of freshly cooked bacon. The eating area had a long table with a feast laid out across it. Poppy's mouth salivated thinking about having a warm and filling meal. The table was covered with plates of eggs, fresh rye bread, and bacon. It was nothing like the breakfast he grew up with, but he couldn't take his eyes off the sight of crispy caramelized bacon before him. He'd never eaten pork before. Jews and bacon, generally an unsightly pairing, especially in my kosher household. In middle school, I became a vegetarian and was never too fond of meat to begin with. The sight and smell of pork nauseated me more than anything else. I would see the grease lining the pan in a hotel fresh to order kitchen and my stomach would quickly begin to turn. Bacon would just never be for me. For Poppy, on the other hand, bacon was the greatest food in the world. His mouth watered as bacon hit the only non-kosher frying pan in his house. As the bacon began to sizzle and crack, Poppy always thought of the point in his journey home where he and his cousin Mickey found refuge in that Polish church. As he told me the story, his eyes lit up. He turned to look over at Mickey for approval, who shrugged and filled his own plate. Mickey was never much for following the rules and who was Poppy to deny a hot meal. They could probably spin the situation to say that they were keeping in the spirit of Pekua Nefesh, watching over the soul, which puts preserving life over following Jewish laws. In reality, they were starving and tired. Keeping kashrut was the last thing on their minds. They piled their plates and felt the, great, the greasy crispiness warm their bodies from head to toe. This was the feeling lost in the camps throughout the war. Freedom. It took me a long time to understand my traditional Jewish grandfather's love for bacon. To him, bacon wasn't just a food. It was a feeling of freedom that allowed him to open the next chapter of his life. Moving forward, he had to come to a crossroads between his identity that he once had and the new life in front of him. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Brooke, how about you go next? Awesome, thank you. That was a beautiful reading. Thank you, uh, Michelle, giving me a tough act to follow. Um, so for my story, I have to start with my grandma's story. She grew up in Siget, Romania. Um, if Siget sounds familiar to you, it's because this is where the book uh, Night was set, um, where Elie Wiesel's story um, begins. Um, and the beginning of that, 
that book is very similar to her experiences um, with the war. Um, so she was uh, rounded up with her family and taken to Auschwitz. And when she was at Auschwitz, um, she passed the first selection, but she actually did not pass any selections after that. She was sent twice to the gas chambers at Auschwitz and escaped both times. Um, and at that point, she was hiding inside of the camps from the Nazis um, so that she wouldn't be caught because she was no longer on any official roles. Um, she ended up um, a year later at Bergen-Belsen where she was liberated at age 14. And from that point on, she pretty much did not ever share her story. Um, it was just something she wanted behind her. She wanted to move on. She had other things she needed to do. So it was just something that she didn't talk about uh, until later in life, one day she asked me um, to write her story. Um, and so that's kind of where my book begins and my experience begins is this story that I didn't know slowly uncovering it with my grandma uh, and beginning to like piece together what happened when um, it was something that no one in my family had really processed. Um, the other different thing about my um, book project compared to the other two panelists is that it's an ongoing project for me. Um, I have a complete draft, but I'm still working on finding a publisher, but pieces of it have been published in various literary magazines. So I'm going to read from one of those pieces now. Um, this is an essay called The Search for My Grandma's 14th Summer. Listening is an act greater than not talking, which is itself a great act. In my grandma's apartment, I pressed my lips together and took in her world. Pill boxes and photo albums, pickle jars turned soup containers, and tried to forget my own. Email drafts and unread texts, my phone, always my phone. My sight changed when I listened, and when I listened closely enough, there was a factory in my grandma's living room. There were prisoners in drab gray clothes, their bare hands wrapped around half-filled grenades. Three miles away was a camp with wooden bunks, a basement kitchen. She was there looking here, wondering when she'd see her sister again. I was here looking there, wondering why I knew so little about the past. After I sat with my grandma, I knew more. I knew my grandma Golda Indig, who was there the night I was born, who nestled me in her arms while an ambulance was called, who cleaned the car afterwards until it looked close to normal had been in three Nazi concentration camps during the Holocaust. I knew she spent the majority of her imprisonment in a forced labor camp where she wasn't on the official role. I knew she had to hide from the SS because of this, hide under bunks and behind buildings. I knew she snuck into the kitchen one day to ask the prisoners there if she could help them peel potatoes. I knew they said yes. I knew she turned 14 in this forced labor camp hidden in a forest far from home. I didn't know the name of the camp. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, Rachel. Thanks, Brooke and Michelle. Now I have two tough acts to follow. Um, Again, thank you guys for, for being here. I'm really excited to share my story. Um, just a little bit more about kind of my past and who I am. I am first-generation American. Uh, my parents came to the U.S. in 1979 from Minsk, Belarus, uh, with the help of the Jewish Federation. They came here with my two older sisters, who at the time were one and a half and five and a half. And they arrived here, crazy enough to think about, with only two suitcases and $50 in their pocket. It took them three months to travel here through Italy. Um, and after only 10 years of a lot of really hard work, they sponsored um, all 18 of the rest of the family members that were living in Belarus and brought them all over here to St. Louis. So that's a little bit about sort of my, my family history, but moving into what my book is about, um, it focuses on my great-grandmother, Raisa, and her two daughters, so Luba is my grandmother, and Sophia, and my great-grandfather, who's Abraham. Um, it follows the family through June of 1941, all the way through the end of the war. And it's, 
it is yes about like the harrowing journey and the trials of the war that they went through, but more so it's really about, I would say the love and the hope that Raisa really carried with her during this time. Uh, my story is a little bit different because it really focuses on the women and um, her mother, her sisters, her daughters, the friends that she made along the way. Um, and that bond and the strength that they really carried was what kept them going through those through those years as they had to flee from the Nazis. Um, I know we often hear that soldiers are really the, the heroes of the war, but I think that there's something to be said about the women of the war and what they had to go through and what they had to survive, those mothers. Um, Raisa was you know, traveling with only a 16 and a 10 year old at that time. And they went 2,500 miles from Minsk to Uzbekistan, fleeing from the Nazis. And just to put that sort of in perspective, because it's hard to imagine, that's the uh, uh, distance from like San Diego to the tip of New York. And they were walking, they were taking trains, um, they were doing any way that they could. And it took them months to arrive there in Kakand. So it's pretty incredible to think about what they went through. For me, it was um, really inspiring because my I have young two young girls thinking about how would I have how would I have done that? How would I have gotten up and ran without my husband, with my two girls, and and fleeing with them by myself? So it was really incredible to uncover um, her story. Uh, most of my novel it is a historical fiction. So I had to piece together a lot of what happened, obviously, since she's not here anymore. Um, but I I had original letters from World War II that, she, that my great-grandfather had sent to my great-grandmother, and that really helped piece that story together. Um, but I did have to sort of put bits and pieces uh, together that were fictionalized to create the story. Um, I do want to share an excerpt from the novel. The first overnight ride we had on the train seemed endless. In the last light of the day, I noticed my parents looked pale right before the sun began to set. Gita and Dubov sat with their hands interlocked and their heads resting on one another. Hanna sat nearest to me with Oscar by her side. His brown hair fell in waves, framing his round chubby face and brown eyes. Baba insisted that it was time to cut it, but Hanna said she could not get herself to cut his baby curls even if he was already five years old. His head lay in her lap and his eyes began to close as he stared at his favorite toy, snuggled tightly in his hands. It was a miniature plastic Pinocchio figurine. The doll's arms and legs moved back and forth stiffly. I could tell by the faded paint that Oscar had given the little Pinocchio a great deal of love. Sophia, Luba, and I held each other close and I tried to close my eyes to sleep, but sleep never came. The sounds of the train, the screeching, the clacking, and the wails of the babies right next to us were a constant reminder of our dreadful surroundings. Every time I started to doze off, I was awakened again, and the night dragged on and on until the sound of nearby explosions jolted us from our sleep. Mama, what is happening? Sophia asked. What was that noise? Her eyes swelled with fright as the sounds grew louder. Fear ignited inside the train car like a blazing fire. Thank you, Rachel and uh, Brooke and Michelle as well, of course. Um, it's just these stories are so inspiring and I certainly um, never tire of hearing them. So thank you. Uh, thank you, all three of you. Um, Rachel, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go to you because we heard from you last um, with our first question. What, what was the impetus, um, you know, for you for writing this book? I mean, how, how, did, how did you get started? What, what, where did this come from? Yeah. So I've always been an avid reader of World War II novels, even since I was a little girl. Um, you would find me late at night under the covers with a flashlight reading, and my mom would come in every night and tell me to go to bed. Um, I loved reading. I would always um, passion for reading, especially World War II. But it wasn't until I was older, and it was about six years ago, that I had finished reading The Nightingale. And something sparked in me that I just started thinking, wait a minute, like, why have I, like, I've been so 
enamored with reading World War II books, but what is my own family history? It wasn't talked about in my household. Um, and it wasn't because in Russia, you just don't talk about things like this. It wasn't like shared. So I don't think it was ever shared with me, even though I know like little stories that had came up, I didn't feel like I knew enough. And I think that that just, I think because I had girls and they were growing up and I wanted to be able to share with them what had happened to my family during that time. Um, so I started asking my mom questions and she told me everything that she could remember that she knew. And that amounted to one piece of paper, literally. And I thought there has to be more out there. There has to be um, more information. So that really sparked a curiosity in me to like find out more. I went down a Google rabbit hole and um, just started digging. And when I started finding information um, and I had uncovered those letters that I had told you about from a family member, and I had found family members in Russia that I had never even knew existed and started talking to them, that is what started it. As soon as I realized that I had this story, um, I wanted to write it down for my kids, for my girls. And that's what it started with. I never thought that I was going to publish this book. It was not about that. It was about sharing it with my children. And then when friends started reading it, they were like, this is not like, you have to share this with the world. This is something more than just something that you share with your kids. So that's what sparked it for me. I love that. It's beautiful. That's um that that speaks very much to 3GNY's mission, you know, which is which is just about legacy transmission, you know, as, as a start. Um, thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, Brooke, what what is what has the writing and, and the publishing, you know, what what is what has writing and publishing this story been like for you? And 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 how has it impacted your understanding of your role as a 3G? Yeah, well. First of all, I would say the experience of writing is very different from the experience of publishing. Um, you can write it without the goal of publishing it. You can't publish it without having written it. You'll have to do both if you wanna go that route. But um, the experience of writing it for me was also an experience of research. And it was, an, it was really starting with questions and like slowly working towards more questions really but I did gain a lot of understanding and starting to like flesh out a lot of gaps in my family's story, um, not just during the war, but also beyond that um, as refugees and moving into North America. So um, the writing process was really like this uncovery process. Um, publishing is a whole other like set of challenges. And I think sometimes it's helpful just to go into them with totally different mindsets. Um, publishing is all about reaching an audience and finding people to connect with. But when you're writing, you're really just connecting with your material and where like leading by instinct to find what um, inspires you and what interests you, because there are a lot of different ways to approach a story. Um, so that's kind of what I've found. I've got these like different modes. And when I started, I didn't really take on the identity of 3G. I didn't think of myself as having a role. I really just thought of my grandma and what she had done. And the more I worked on the project, the more I worked on publishing, the more I began to see my own role in the world as somebody of the third generation, which is very different from being a survivor. But it as a descendant of a survivor, you have this very intimate uh, relationship with a sur survivor directly. And I began to like understand what that meant for me and shape it more into my own identity, um, speaking through 3GNY being a part of that. So it really became part of the writing and publishing process for me. Right, interesting. Um, and and Michelle, I guess I'll, I'll ask you a similar sort of question. I mean, how it sounds as though um, you know, I think that that all of your stories really do have your own understanding of your position, you know, um, as very sort of front and center. So, so Michelle, I just would like to ask you how how did your identity as a three G impact this process? You know, what what do you think the difference is between your voice and someone else? You know, writing a Holocaust narrative. So um, originally when, so I guess kind of answering Rachel's question in addition to my own, um, I feel like I also was very into World War II and Holocaust books growing up, which 
it was a weird thing to say, you know, what's your favorite genre? And that would be what I said in like the fifth grade. Um, but I always, I've kind of always known my grandfather was a survivor. It wasn't like one day they kind of told me it was like something that just was kind of always part of my identity and very ingrained within me. And from the first time that I had learned like formally about the Holocaust, I asked him if I could hear his story. And my grandfather had never really talked about it very much. People knew that he was a survivor and he, they knew pieces, but when I had asked him, it really kind of opened him up to sharing it. And as I heard his story for as long as I can remember, I said, I have to write this. And I was going to write it about him and it was going to be his story. And as I started writing about him, I realized how important and how ingrained the Holocaust and being a 3G was for me. So ultimately I kind of tried to pair my own experiences with it and just being a 3G and learning about generational trauma when I was in therapy and realizing that so many stories are just about the survivor and they start when the Nazis came in and they end at liberation and they don't include anything about their life before, their life after, what happened to their families. And I felt like it was really important to showcase that. I think I have a quote about this, that survivors are real people and they're not just characters in a movie. Their lives weren't defined to a couple of years. Right, yeah, um, beautiful. And and can you talk a little bit about, about your process and, and how you sort of chose the particular format that you wrote in, what research you undertook, what the editing process was like for you? Yeah. Um, so during COVID, I kind of came to a realization that my grandfather was not going to be around forever. And it was something I had known, but it like really hit me during COVID given the circumstances. So I went, now's, now's the time I have to start. And I had actually seen a couple of people that I went to college with who had published books and they had done it through what looked like a course, um, looked like a class. And I asked more questions about it and got information, spoke to the lead of this course and decided that I'd never written anything before in my life other than maybe a diary when I was in elementary school. And I needed structure. I didn't have any idea how to develop a character. I had no idea that these stories that I had heard were pretty easily pieced together into something once you have the main points. And that was kind of going to Brooke's point where you have certain elements, you have certain things, you know, um, and you kind of start, or at least how I did it was I started with the big moments that I knew and things that I knew were crucial to include. And then I filled in the gaps along the way. Um, during the process of writing this book, my grandfather was still alive um, during my first draft. So he had been interviewed, he had written a short one or two page kind of summary of his experience. And then he had actually done a three hour long interview. Um, might've actually been longer than that, that during COVID before he was vaccinated, I was able to see him in person that he, I literally transcribed this interview and then developed additional questions that I needed him to answer in order to continue working through the story. Sometimes he answered the questions, sometimes he didn't answer the questions, but answered other things um, and kind of finding the way to work through that with him to build a first draft. And then um, he unfortunately passed away in the middle of it, but the editing process was looking at what I wrote, that something I was so proud of, I put so much work into and going, this is horrible, I need to rewrite the whole thing. Um, and that's, I think, a very normal part of writing anything. You write something and then you rewrite it and you rewrite it and you rework it. And maybe you completely change the order of something. I'm pretty sure Rachel cut out the first chapter of her book that she had originally written. Um, and just knowing that the more you work on it, the better it is going to get. And it's okay if you feel like you put all this work in and that, you know, it still has a long way to go. Thank you. I'm sure there are many people that are inspired by the fact that you had never written anything except for a diary as a kid. You know, I think that's, um, you know, 
just inspiring to people out there that might be wanting to do a similar thing. So thank you for um for sharing that. Um, Rachel, could you talk to us a little bit about um about about the publishing process? I mean, you know, if you you Brooke was right that they're totally separate things, the writing and the publishing. But if we're talking about sort of someone that really has a desire to get a story read by by the world, um, you know, how how might how might you go about that? How does that work? The, and and the marketing, I guess, too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I feel like I'm I was in sort of a similar place as Michelle. Again, I never considered myself a writer, and I had no idea when I went into this what was involved with writing a book, right? Like you're sitting there, you, it's one thing to research and uncover all these great things. And then you outline it, you write it, you edit it a, a hundred million times until you get kind of what you want. But then you're sitting there and you're like, okay, so now what do I do? What's next? And then you start realizing that there's not really just one avenue to publish your, your novel. There's so many different ways that you can go about it. Um, and for me, my process was I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go the traditional route. I'm going to submit all these queries to these agents and I'm going to see what happens with that. And I'm not going to lie. That was an incredibly long and very stressful process for me, but I absolutely don't regret it. Um, it is something that taught me a lot about myself and the strength that I have, because it's very difficult to send out these queries and hope that agents are going to read your novel and then they never get back to you. And I sent out hundreds of them. Um, I was very lucky. I had a couple agents request to read the entire novel. And ultimately I didn't go the traditional route. And the reason was, is because they wanted to, they wanted to change the ending. And that was important to me. I wanted to keep the book as factual as possible, even though it was still a historical fiction the ending happened. That's That was the real case. And I didn't want to put a happy cherry on top and make this a happy story because it wasn't necessarily a happy story. So for me, it was important to keep the integrity of my novel and keep, um, keep it how it was, true to it. So that was when I decided that I wanted to go the route of self-publishing. And I'm so happy that I did that. Um, to talk about marketing, that's like sort of the next step. So here you are finally realizing, okay, and publishing it is, and if you go down self-publishing, you have to think about, okay, who's going to do the cover, the cover of the, of the book, right? So I actually designed the cover of the book myself. This is my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather, um, but who's going to do the layout and the interior and all of these things that go along with it. So that was a piece of it. Once you're done with that, then no matter what route you choose, if you are going to go traditionally or you're going to self-publish, you still have to market your, your book. And that's all on you to do that. So for me, um, I think it was really about organizing myself. I set up a Trello board and I figured out which platforms I was going to target and market my book on. There was no way that I was going to be able to market on every single platform out there. I'm, I'm not in marketing, right? I'm a I'm a user experience designer. That's what I do. I don't do marketing. So for me, it was like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to pull this off? And I just had to focus on, okay, where, where can I, where am I comfortable talking about my book and engaging with people? And I think that was the most important lesson that I learned is it's, if you step back and think about, I'm not trying to just sell my book. I'm trying to have conversations with people. So for me, it was about starting those conversations and reaching out to people and listening to their story and sharing my stories. And when I started thinking less about trying to sell the book and thinking more about just sharing the story and having more and more people read it, that's when people started coming to me and saying, hey, I'm really, I really want to read your book or I've read your novel and it impacted me so much. And it was really important that you shared this with us. So I think that was what was amazing for me. And then just reaching out to like local organizations. So for me, I've spoken with lots of book groups here in St. Louis, um, you know, spoken with different Jewish federations around the country and just been really open to having open conversations about my story. I, I think you could probably write a book about publishing a book because that was very thorough and I'm sure very very helpful um thank yeah. you so much for sharing all of that um, sure. 
Uh, Brooke, I, I'll ask one final question for you before we um, jump into some great questions that have come in on the Q&A. Um, and that is, what advice would you give to other three Gs or anyone, I suppose, um, that is interested in writing and publishing their grandparents' stories? Yeah, if you're interested in writing anything, a lot of people will tell you it's really difficult. It's a long road. But I would say if you have the interest, do it. Whether you publish it or not is its own separate question, but to document it, to put yourself in it, include your 3G experience, whatever your angle is, I highly recommend like just, just start. You don't have to have it all figured out. I feel like I learned everything one step after it would have been helpful, but I learned it eventually. And so it just just start the process and you'll discover more and more tools uh, to start piecing things together. Um, and it, it really just begins with starting to write. Um, once, you, once you're there, you can add in more research, you can research into publishing more, connect with other writers um, and learn their stories, how they have connected. If, I also recommend reading a lot of Holocaust literature. Um, and you can always see in contemporary literature, there's often an acknowledgement section at the end where people will talk about how they published it and they'll think like their agent or their editor. Um, so you can learn details that way too. So I recommend kind of like just jumping in. There's a lot to learn, but uh, there's it's you can't learn it all before you get started. You just have to start. Great advice. Um, is there anything, Rachel or Michelle, that you wanted to add just to that particular question? I would I would like to add that it is it's so worth it. Like it was a ton of work and it was such a long journey. But for me, the day that I published my book, my kids were doing virtual and my daughter, I overheard her. She was in virtual school with her class and she had said I overheard her saying guess what guys, my mom published her book today and I'm so proud of her. That, that was it for me. Like that was all that I ever needed to know that what I did was impactful and it was important. Um, so if you have a story that you want to write down, do it. Even if it's something that you keep for yourself, just do it. And also the whole pride thing. Um, I think my favorite thing about having written this book isn't I love my family so much and I know that they're proud of me and that makes me super happy but when it's somebody that I don't know and I've gotten to speak with them about my family story and it affects them in some way and it matters to them and my grandfather was my favorite person in the entire world and getting to share my favorite person having other people know him and see him the way I did is it's everything. Amazing. Thank you. Um, we are going to go to the Q&A. Um, we've, as I said, got some great questions that have come in. There's also some questions that um, I'm noting a particular kind of questions that might be, um, we, we can actually answer on email. So if I don't get that to you, there's specific questions from people. Um, so I'm sorry if we don't get to all of them, but uh, let's dive in. Some of these are specific, uh, directed to individuals and some you can answer as you see fit. Um, first question is, what what role, if any, did the parents of the 3G writers have in their writing projects? I can speak a little bit to this. Um, so my um, grandma's on my maternal side, so it's my mom's mom. And there are a lot of ways in which I couldn't have done this without my mom's support. She helped connect me with certain people and start conversations. And there are other ways in which my mom just like didn't have certain memories. I would ask her about certain things and she really didn't remember, like she had kind of blocked that out. Um, and so it, it was just one source. Like I, I had to talk to multiple people. I had to do my own research. Um, and in that way, like it wasn't like she knew everything and could just hand it down to me um, because oftentimes um, survivors aren't able to talk to their own children in the same way they're able to talk to their grandchildren just because of space and time. Um, so that was what it was like in my family. Um, but certainly both my parents were extremely helpful just in being supportive and picking up the phone when I called. 
amazing. Um, this is a question for Brooke. Um, the question is, I was interested to hear that your grandmother had never told her story, but then at some point asked you to write it down. Can you tell us a little bit more about that decision or request? What changed her mind? This is a question I still don't have an answer for. I have theories, but it was never something she could clearly articulate. When she was trying to convince me to like write her story, she kept telling me like I could make money off of it. I'm like, I'm not really looking for that right now. Um, doesn't sound like an efficient way to make money. Um, but I think two things were happening. I think she started to see her friends talk about it more. Um, people were doing more interviews, um, largely with the Shoah Foundation. Um, people were writing their own stories. And I think it started to inspire her and give her the idea that she didn't have to hold it all herself because I think she always felt like it was on her to keep it. Um, and that was an inspiration to her. And I also think she just started to feel like the, the passage of time, like if she didn't share, no one would know. Um, and I think that's its own weight. Um, so those are my guesses as like some of her motivations, but it really was never anything she could clearly articulate. Um, she almost pitched the idea to me like she was doing me a favor. So it was very hazy from the get-go. Right. Thank you. Um, and, and a similar question, actually, um, which is somewhat of a, of a broader question, but it's if you have a grandparent that never wanted to speak about their experiences, do you think you have an ethical obligation to not write or speak about it after their death? I don't know. That, that's, that's for anybody, I guess, that, that might have a take on that. I feel like that's really complicated um, in terms of, I guess, using my own experience, my grandfather, um, he didn't talk about it, not because he was, I guess, against it, but he was never going to bring it up. But once we did ask the questions, he would answer them. And I think knowing, it's really important to know your grandparent and understand why they chose not to share whether it was a conscious choice of you know nobody asked me about it or it was really painful to talk about or the fact that they truly did not want that to be how they were remembered and how they were memorialized in that way and for my grandfather whenever I told him I wanted to write this book he, he looked at me and he was like really and I think he was such a humble person that every time, you know, I was like, this, this is so important. Like your story needs to be heard. He would go, that is there to say that hasn't been said before. He didn't think his story was special. He didn't think that it needed to be shared because so many other peoples were shared. And I think that from an ethical standpoint, if you do have the knowledge to see why that story was not chosen to be shared, it might better be able to help you decide if you should or should not continue with it. Interesting, good answer, thank you. Um, Rachel, a question for you. Can you speak to your decision to write fiction rather than nonfiction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately for me, because it wasn't something that was spoken about too much, uh, my mom didn't have very much information. So all I had to go by were some like little bit of documentation and then the letters which weren't complete right because they were only from my great grandfather writing to my great grandmother so I didn't have both sides of the letters um and I didn't have enough of the pieces that I was able to write a nonfiction piece um and so that was obvious for me that I needed to go towards um doing something that was fiction but I can say that for me, it was extremely important that anything that went into the novel could have actually happened during that time. I spent over a year researching, and that included listening to um, other people's stories who had a very similar journey from Belarus to Uzbekistan, um, talking to other people in the community who lived during that time in, in Minsk. Um, so for me, it was important to make sure that even though this was a historical fiction novel, there nobody was going to read the book and say, 
well, that couldn't have happened because I know I've read historical fiction novels and I'm like, that does not seem like it could happen. So for me, it was extremely important that even though it was still fiction, it could have happened and it probably, it probably did. It maybe didn't happen to her, but um, I did want to keep it as close to the truth as possible. And Brooke and Michelle, did 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 you also undertake sort of a, a large amount of historical research in the writing process, aside from sort of just the research on the personal family history? I actually didn't do a ton of research. I had a lot of background knowledge and there were elements of my story that I then supplemented with research. But as with many a memoir, um, the facts in the book are my grandfather's facts. They are the way he remembers it. That doesn't mean historically that is 100% the way that it happened or exactly the number, but it is the number or what he remembers of it. And I think um, we each have our own truths and understanding that when you read a memoir is really important. Um, if, if you're someone without much writing experience, do you recommend taking a course to learn how to write a memoir? Um, I suppose, Michelle, this might be something that you, you want to answer as you sort of, you know, claim that you didn't have any experience. Um, but that's, that's the question sort of, do you recommend a course if you're someone that has never really written before? I think it's a personal choice there. Um, for me, I had just started, um, my full-time job out of college and I was working in public accounting, which has some pretty crazy hours. And if we're being honest, I don't think I had the discipline to be able to do it on my own. And I think I needed my hand held a little more. I needed someone to tell me, you need to write this much by this date, and this is how you have to do it. And have somebody that was constantly holding me accountable. And after my grandfather passed away, I actually had had a conversation with Rachel right before that. And I was like, I think I'm actually going to completely self-publish now that I've written the first draft. And after he passed away, I almost couldn't get myself to write anymore. I couldn't go back to it. It took me over six months to even pick it up again. Um, so I think it's knowing yourself. I think if you have the passion for the story and you have the time and the discipline to understand how to build a character arc and how to develop a story, absolutely don't pay to take a class to do it. If you think that you need the structure and if you don't, because I didn't trust myself to be able to do it. And I was worried that I was going to stop and then he wouldn't be here when I picked it back up. So I kind of needed the timetable to keep me pushing forward. Um, Thank you. Um, a, a, a question in, in a similar or follow on to that um, is did, and I suppose, if I guess Rachel or Brooke could, could speak to this, did, did you spend a certain amount of time each day writing um, or did you have periods of time where you, you know, you weren't working on it, on, on the book? Um, I can start with that one. So for me, I was actually a stay-at-home mom during the time that I had started writing. And for me, it was nap time. That was my time to write. And it was the only time that I could write. So when people ask me, how long did it take you? I said, it took me a year of nap time. Um, and it really did. And that kept me focused. It was quiet. I was able to, to write. Um, I think you have to sort of to piggyback off of Michelle, you sort of have to regiment yourself. You have to sort of give yourself this like, okay, I'm going to try to write this much each day. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes I close the computer and I couldn't think of anything. I had nothing. But if you at least give yourself that time and you set aside a certain time of day where you know you can write, um, it's important and it kind of keeps you on track. Um, also, just like one quick note to piggyback off of Michelle's um, response is I also agree that you don't necessarily have to take a class, but we can, you guys can also lean on other people. There are really great critique writer groups that are super helpful. And I went through many rounds of editing and writing with other people and learning about how they were writing their novel, helped me write my novel, and we all helped each other. So there are people within communities of writing or just other people, authors who are willing to sort of help with that process that you can lean on. Thank you. Um, a, uh, a different sort of topic um, we might move to uh, is, is, is another question that asks, how did your grandparents' experiences influence your own attitudes towards Germans and Germany? 
Did you ever have an aversion to the idea of visiting Germany? And if so, how did that change? Or did it change? I can start, I guess. Um, really interesting and I think very uncommon. My grandfather did not have any aversion to Germans or Germany. He had a Krupp's coffee pot. He worked in a Krupp's factory during the war. And he told me he knew it was well-made because of that. Um, and my grandfather had a wicked sense of humor. And so for me, I never had a strict aversion to Germany, German products, because if he didn't, I had no right to, in my opinion. Um, and I kind of took his by example. However, I did have a very sharp reaction to anything I perceived as remotely anti-Semitic or ignorant of what had happened. Thank you. Um, I've got two more questions and I know there's there's more in the, in the chat, um, but we'll get to that in a second. Let me just ask these last two as we're sort of getting to the end of our hour. Our hour. Um, do you feel your grandparents found it easier to tell you their stories that they maybe never told your parents? Yeah, I can speak to this. Um, I actually got an email from my aunt at some point in my project and she said, I'm so glad that mom's talking to you. We were always too close to talk. And I think there was this uh, strong uh, desire to protect the second generation and to keep them focused on what's ahead and the future and to really keep silent at what the survivor themselves explored. Um, and it wasn't until kind of the safety of distance and time that when grandchildren started to ask those questions, we would actually get answers. And so I think because I actually had more distance in my relationship with my grandma than her children did with her, it was a lot easier for us to talk about this um, in a way like even now, I, I know the story far better than they do. Yeah, I think that's a common, uh, a common thing that we as grandchildren speak of you know this idea of of somehow the second generation were protected and we had you know we were in a different a different place um so thank you thank you for sharing that um i will ask one final question um and this is back to the um the publishing and writing process but the question is are there any financial investments that need to be made in the in the publishing or the writing process I think for me, the biggest chunk was my editor. Um, I, I did, I was nervous because I didn't know how my novel was going to go and, and if it was going to sell, if people were going to want to read it. Um, but I took that leap of sort of faith and I knew that I knew that I had a story, but if it wasn't edited properly, it wouldn't, it, it would you know, it could look bad, like if it wasn't edited right, right? So that was the one thing that I wanted to get right in my eyes. So I spent a good chunk of money on my editor. Everything else, I tried to do as much as I could on my own. Like I designed my own cover. I did my layout. All of those things I think cost money as well as if you're marketing and you're spending money on advertising, that that adds up. So that for me, the editor was the biggest chunk, I would say. And then I also had... um the audio. So I did hire somebody to do the audio and that was also a big chunk of money there. Um, there's, there's one more question I'll squeeze in. Did, did any of you speak your story before you started the writing project? This might be a, a question um, directly related to, to our We Do program. I wonder whether anyone could speak to that. I mean, I started writing before speaking, so that's my short answer, but because I had written so much, it actually made, you know, condensing that into a 20 minute talk a lot easier um, and really helped like, you know, me, me understand my, my own role in the story and the continuation of the story. Um, but I did start with writing first. I, on the other hand, did not, or I started with writing first, not speaking first, yeah. Um, I had written an entire first draft. I had been 
deep in the details. And I thought it was really important to be able to articulate. I actually did it, um, did we do as part, almost a cathartic coping mechanism for me after my grandfather passed away because I couldn't get myself to even look at my manuscript. I couldn't speak about him. And I felt like being in a community um, of three Gs, many of whom had um, also lost their grandparents. It did make it a lot easier for me to go back and continue my story. And then, so it was writing, speaking, writing, and now I'm back to speaking where a lot of people, they um, do their marketing in kind of online or in written form. And I think that for me, I've chosen to, I love to talk. I think that's probably pretty obvious. Um, and I think that it makes it really personal to be able to do events like this and um, speak about it. So we do um, has been really amazing. And 3GMY has been really amazing and giving me the confidence to be able to share this story. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you. Um, as a 3GNY board member, I think that's an excellent place to finish. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to I want to thank all of you, and I also just want to um, just just quickly mention. I know there's um, there's some a few more questions in the chat that were sort of specific about the the writing and publishing and certain technical questions. Um, I have seen them. We we have seen them. And what I wanted to say is that um, you know we're hoping that um, this might uh, spark you know perhaps a 3G writers group that might meet or some mentoring opportunities that might happen between these fabulous women here and uh, some of you that might be really interested in, in trying to sort of get, get projects off the ground. Um, so don't worry, we, we've got all that and we're hoping for more. And if you really want, if you're interested in this, please email us. Um, I think that we can put the uh, um, our details in, in the chat. Um, so you have all that. But I really want to thank um, Michelle, Rachel, Brooke for joining us this evening and all of you. Um, if you liked what you've experienced tonight, we encourage you to visit our website and join our mailing list where you'll get information about more events like this and also about our We Do training and when the next classes are being run. Um, also via our website, you could help us out with a financial gift if you're so inclined. As I mentioned earlier, our work is only possible through the generosity of our community. Your contribution will go directly to training more We Do speakers so that we can impact even more students. We do not solicit donations from schools or teachers. We provide our programming completely free of charge. So your support is really necessary. Um, there's a link in the chat. So we will hope you that you'd, you'd consider making a, a donation. If you've already donated, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, again, thank you all so much for being here tonight and to our amazing panelists. Um, you're all helping us to honor the memories of our grandparents and keep the lessons and legacies of the Holocaust alive. Thank you all. Good night.